welcome also from my side. Um, we're very happy that so many people are here. Um, I would especially like to welcome Alexander Birchler. I'm very happy that you made your way from Texas. And we're very sorry that Teresa is not able to come because she has commitments at the university. So we'll have to do the talk um, just ourselves, but I think it will be very good. So the main focus of our talk today will be how Teresa Hubbard and Alexander Bichler deal with narration and what their especially interest in cinema is, as our um, subject of the festival is Kino and Kunst. Teresa Hubbard and Alexander Bichler have collaborated since 1990 and work with sculptures, photography, and what interests us most tonight with video, with moving images. Um, and I think what is most characteristic for me in your work is that you have very precise staging. Um, you choose your sites where you shoot in a very um, precise way. Uh, you have a very great love for details in your work and, um, and high awareness of what to be shown and what to be hidden. So my first question would be, um, you both originally come from sculpture and from photography. When and why did you start working with moving images? Okay. Well, first, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, we usually talk in English, that's so, so we just figured out it's strange to change our language. So it, I hope it will go fine. Um, what brought us to film and video, when Teresa and I started, when Teresa and I, we met actually in a band at the Banff Center for the Arts, which is a place in Canada, it's in a, in a national park in Alberta. And um, it's, nowadays, it's actually the most uh, productive place for performing arts and the visual arts. So most of the Canadian artists, visual arts that you know, they would go and produce their works there. So it, we were very, uh, fortunate to have the chance to be there as artists in residence and it was a very um, fruitful time to start working. We both were working in sculpture and uh, at that time and we started making uh, an exhibition together and uh, the exhibition's title was called Liquid and Solid. That was the first exhibition and, and Teresa would show her work and I would show my work and that was the only time we ever did this. And um, the reception of the exhibition was in some way that people thought that we actually collaborated, which we didn't. We talked about the work and we talked about the exhibition, but we didn't, you know, share um, a work. So as an experience, we really enjoyed that and we decided that we should actually indeed collaborate. And uh, at that time, we also, um, we started to date each other, so we became a couple. So everything was very fast at that time and we tried to um, stay like on stay on track with wh what we had in mind, and so we went to uh, do our graduate studies, which we did. We chose to go to the Nova, St uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, which is a very kind of mysterious, somewhat remote place, but it has an incredible, um, fascinating history in the 70s, uh, as it was kind of a at the time, it was a very conceptual sort of place, like basically what happens in the 70s during the Vietnam War, a lot of American artists tried to get out of uh, the country of the US, and so Barry Neil Kennedy, the president, had this opportunity to bring a lot of his friends, so Wallace Ari, Vito Conchi, uh, Solowit, all these people would come up, uh, official, and start teaching uh, Christoph Wodichko. And so Casper um, uh, Koenig would start a press, like Benjamin Buckle and Casper Koenig would start the uh, Nova Scotia Press. And um, when we went to the school, like all of that mystery kind of faded. People didn't know quite a bit about that history, but it was definitely a, a school that has a heavy conceptual background. So when we started doing these narrative works, which were still sculptural works, I think we we received a lot of criticism. It was not a, so it was tough, it was a tough school for us. It was not, we were not welcome with those ideas and we had to really fight for the idea of being, of, of wanna bring narrative into, in, in, into the visual arts at that time. And um, I have to jump forward obviously. So we started, I think the, the, the first medium that we really kind of embraced one of the first one was photography because we started traveling quite a bit for almost 10 years. We kind of traveled wherever we could make work, which basically was following either artist residencies or grants. 
and um, photography seemed at the beginning the best medium to work with. We did a piece, a very early film piece, which is called, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it was actually a fictional, I forgot it, the title, but it was a fictional um, documentary about a woman who got struck by lightning. That, that actually was the first uh, video we made. And then the, it took maybe three, four years, and we did, which is interesting too to me now, we did a piece about two ballroom dancers, which also has this kind of interest between uh, fictional and narrative, narrative that we talk maybe later about it. And that piece was called um, Desert Song. And right now we're working, just as I speak, with a, a dancer. So it's interesting for me to go back that far. But back to your question. Okay, thank you for that. Um, visitors have the chance to see House with Pool here tonight, today. It will be screened after our talk again if you didn't have the chance to look at it. It's really a great piece. And um, I would like to talk a bit how you construct the narration. Um, we see two women, a young woman and um, an older woman, and they both seem to be connected but never meet in this house where they both move. And um, it is the first work where you actually shoot on a real place. You didn't build up a set, and um, it was you. You really let compose a melody, which is played by the two women in the loop, but also functions as a film music. So um, this is a piece which differs very much from the uh, former works, in my opinion. And um, I would like to know a little bit how this work developed and what makes the difference for you from the former works. Um, at the time, I think when we showed uh, House with Pool the first time, it seemed to us and to the audience definitely sort of a similar um, reception that you just gave. If I look back now, it seems, um, it seems quite similar. So um, the one thing about the set in the real place that is really, now I have to put that really in perspective, at that time, um, actually the house that you see in, this, in, 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 this, in House with Pool, it was actually an abandoned house. And um, we basically redressed the entire house to make it look like somebody is living in the house. So there was actually, there's probably more um, staging or set dressing involved than in any of our previous works. And the previous works, the only difference to the previous, well, there's a couple of differences to the previous works. So when we started kind of uh, focusing on video works, which was that 2000 and 2001, we made a basically a trilogy, very fast three works, which was called uh, Eight. Um, single light and detached building, all these works that kind of dealt with a, a somewhat a singular character. Even in detached building, there were also um, some background characters. But so, in, in it, it was still focused on the idea of a set of architecture. And in order to achieve these continuous takes, which we were interested in, because we talked once we were once we came from, from out of photography, we always talked about want to make. A more um, like kind of, we talked about making a long photograph that was really because we, we developed the idea of the, of the cinematic language actually in photography, and there was a very distinctive moment where we had a frame we, we, we made a photograph that looks like a frame stuck in the middle of the picture, so as if like a film projector would be stuck, and that was actually the photograph. And from, the, from that moment on, it was very clear to us that we have to go to. And to, to, to a moving image, there was just no way out of it. And also our experience to work with, at that time, already working with actors from the theater, that kind of gave us the confidence also like learning. Like Teresa and I, we never learned, we, we didn't learn anything about filmmaking or photography. So we had to acquire almost 10 years, I think, the, sort of as a language, our, like also a language between Teresa and me in order to establish like kind of an, an, an a, a, a artist identity. And uh, so the difference in, in House with Pool is, I think, one, when we started shooting House with Pool, when we started planning it, we wanted to do exactly the same thing as we did in Single Wide and Eight and Detached Building. We wanted to have this continuous take. So we started drawing it out because they were all basically shaped on a, on, on a figure, on a drawing. So Eight was shaped as the Eight, as an infinite, infinite sign and detached building was a line and single line was a circle. And so we started drawing basically the script for House's Pool and it, it, it got a quite a, kind of a, like a movie loop. It got very complex and we talked to, uh, to the owner of the house. We started like deciding where we would make cuts into the house and there were, 
they were very supportive of that and but we did we ended up not using those so um, we wanted to we actually were looking for a house because we wanted to find a modernist house because we're interested in um, the definition of space between interiority and exteriority and so a modernist house was all about inside is an outside uh, openings are built for taking pictures like a window is always like a, a view a picture so all that was like that that was the reason why and like there's a there's sort of a, a shift of um, a shift of perception in terms of what is inside what is outside it's, it slips so the slippage we, we wanted architecture that slips so that's what led us to houses pool and then the other thing of house houses pool which is like very similar to um, to the sides, so actually all the sides before they were already sides. I think the, the moment where we actually went out of the studio was actually still in Berlin. We worked up in Berlin, always inside the studio. The film stills, the photographs, were the first time where we actually left the studio. And since then we kind of work much more on the real sides. So the other thing about Houses Pool is the house was abandoned and, it, and the reason why it was abandoned is because it slips down the hill. And if you watch really carefully you, and you watch the pool, you see that the pool, actually the water in the pool is, is, at, is, is askew. And so everything in, the, everything in this house was not quite functioning. So there were animals inside the house and there were, uh, you could hear the raccoons going through the AC shafts. And all that kind of led to the story. So we actually spent a summer being in the house. We used it as a studio and wrote the script for House's Pool. And we very quickly realized that it has to be a story of three characters and not just one. Yeah. Um, there's this tension which cannot be solved in House with Pool. It's a story and you watch it again and again. It's an endless loop actually. And um, when you see it for the first time, you, I just came in and just thought, hey, it looks like, like a movie in the cinema because of its aesthetic of its images. And, then you watch it and realize, no, it's not a movie, it's um, a, a movie which would be shown in cinema because um, a lot of things which would be part of a classical narration are missing. Like there's no exposition as it is a loop. We just enter and enter at the point of the story where we enter the space. Um, the characters, we, we, you don't give any information about the character so that the viewer would not um, identify oneself with the characters and um, there's no solution or, or one could say on the other hand that there are a lot of solutions for the story we try to construct a story but we'll never get the final clue what you what you tell the viewer so um, I'm very interested about how to hear a little bit about your interest in the mystery and when you construct your stories, um, do you yourself have a clear story, what you would like to tell? Um, yeah. um, well, first, um, um, we, we, uh, I think we don't use the word mystery ever. Like when we talk about the work, we, I think we don't like it. Um, because mystery seems to lead to, to, a, to it doesn't mean, seem to lead to some, somehow if you know the, if you know the, the right keys, it would it would solve potentially the mystery. So we we talk often about gaps and we talk about like entry points and we talk about sort of cracks in a story. And in order to to be able to have in order to have a character that sort of um, has these cracks, be conscious. Like we also don't like sort of a surreal. People sometimes talk about it's surreal, and uh, we also don't like that interpretation. We don't conceive it as surreal. Like we do actually. To a certain extent, develop a character and have quite a specific idea of what the character, what the character characters before and after, and what the relation is. At what point, why why are we at this point entering this character's um, scene? But um, interestingly, Teresa and I we don't really have the exact same interpretation of the character. So by the time actually the character is sort of built in a shape that we like it. We, uh, we don't see exactly the same story, but we do have to have a sort of uh, quite a definite idea of what, what, what our character is supposed to be in, 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 in the story. And I think the reason why we like to build these gaps is we, we and which maybe leads us then to the loop, we really like to build uh, entry points. So we really think we really, I mean, at, 
which I think that comes all the way out of NASCAD and Nova Scotia Culture Web Design, sort of the critical thinking about we really believe in sort of an authorship of a viewer and we really want that sort of a viewer can enter some of these storylines. And I think that's also often one of the differences to cinema. There's, there's, there's a lot of entry points in terms of personal interpretation that maybe sometimes cinema doesn't provide. Yeah, so um, that's maybe a good point to talk about the Endless Loop as a format, which is actually a perfect format for uh, presenting a work in a museum, but um, you use it as a contextual strategy. So do you think that if showing, if you show your story in an endless loop, you construct it as an endless loop, um, does that lead to more reflection um, how stories are constructed because you, you don't, as a viewer, you don't just see a beginning and end, but you see this loop and then you have to construct where does the story begin and you have to realize that there is no beginning and no end. So is, would you agree that the loop as a format leads to more reflection um, how stories are constructed? Um, I w I, yeah, I mean, I would like to think so. I mean, that was the purpose why we started creating. There's different kinds of loops that we have worked on. So I think the first ones, like a single life detached film, you know, they're much more kind of just formed on a, on a like somewhat repetition, and so they function more like in a sense of uh, obsession and um, um, trauma. And I think then, like House of Pool and also um, a work called Night Shift, it works much more like on the sort of a double bind or a paradox, like where the characters mm -hmm. kind of repeat themselves within the story or something like that, or like there's impossibilities, somewhat impossibilities, like in House of Pool when the, the woman is swimming in the same pool as that deer supposedly is. And so there's these paradox that, that start, or these characters appear seemingly at the same place, but do they see each other? We, we don't know. So um, these loops, I think we created the loops um, from the very beginning because we had the idea of a long photograph. So we just wanted, there was something that led us to the idea of a moving image that we, we didn't see fulfilled in our photographic work that we saw inside the camera, the photographic camera, which is, I, I, I just love the apparatus. I love the moment of actually taking a picture, but it's still, still there's sort of the, there's somewhat a disappointment after you take the picture. And so uh, that, I think that led us to this kind of idea of a possible continuous moment. And I think, I think that's, that's how it started in House with Pool. I think we already realized all the fascination about cinema in terms of also allowing ourselves. Like the, the huge difference to the other ones is, in the other ones, like um, the previous ones, there was no, uh, the close-up, the only way we could create a close-up is if the character moves towards us. And in House of Pool is the first time that we allow ourselves to move towards the character and but they both all function the character the, the camera is always a detached uh, a, 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 a camera that has no um, uh, no pity for our actors or characters okay. um, we already talked about um, that you use and, and break with narrative strategies which are, one is familiar with uh, from cinema but the cinema is not something only which you use as a visual archive, but um, you deal with cinema as a mental and a real place at the same time. Um, you have, you already mentioned your, your photograph series, like um, Film Stills 1 and 2, and there's uh, Film Stills The End. There's another one, um, Asana, where you staged a woman in a cinema. And your new trilogy you're working on with grandparents, Texas and Melier, which are already done, and the third one, Giant, which will be finished soon, um, they all deal with the idea um, of cinema. And I'm really curious, why is the cinema such a central part in your work? Um. Uh, I think there's many, many, many reasons why. I think it, it just has a... I think the, the, the apparatus of the cinema, I really, I, I, I see, and I think Teresa probably thinks in similar ways, I see a, a, a cinema, the classical cinema, I see it as an inverted camera. And so I have this illusion, or I have this um, uh, fascination of being, if you're in the cinema, you're basically inside the camera. And you have this, uh, you see everything, you see the entire world framed. 
but in real, sort of this, this double reality. And um, I think it is, it is somewhat, I always imagine to be, if I could be inside the camera, I would see the picture um, mediated however faster than actually it is reaching me through the medium. Sort of, I do want to see, for some strange reason, I want to see an, an image mediated, but I want to see this quickest, as fast as I can, but not, not without the mediation. So the, the cinema, I think, as, a, as an architecture, um, creates just this fascinating place of being um, inside a camera. And I think that's the first thing. I think there's another thing I've been thinking about that uh, last night, actually, um, which is more personal. Like when I, when, I, when I was a teenager, I worked in a cinema um, as a ticket taker. And um, um, I, I grew up in a very small, I would call somewhat bland Swiss town. And I, so I worked in the cinema, which is called Rio. And uh, I watched these movies. And it just created, like, for a very brief moment, such a uh, such an like, attraction and such an exoticism of places that I imagined at that time I imagined I never could ever reach. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this incredible image that every night I would close up the cinema, and my uh, the person the projectionist would come down the stairs. He would close up his shop. He would get up up on his moped, and he was a very heavy man. And so I see him driving away. And then I get on my bicycle and I drive back home. And it, it was incredibly beautiful but depressive. And so I think it just that, that moment stuck with me because Rio, just in it, the name itself, seemed to be a place, an unreachable place. Mm -hmm. In your series, uh, this trilo trilogy, I already mentioned Grand Paris, Texas, and Melier. Um, there are two new elements, I think, which came in. Um, it's in the first place, it's more documentary character. You really shoot at real places, um, trace, uh, look for traces of um, in the in these in these um, in in Grand Paris, Texas, but also in Melie, there's a movie mountain, and Teresa Hubbard and Alexander Wilder look for. Um, for the history of why this movie mountain is called movie mountain and um, so that's the first one that it's more documentary character and the second one is that you have films with a beginning and end and that's the first time that you do that so um, provocatively we could ask um, have you exhausted the format loop and um, have you exhausted the format fiction um, what do you think um. Lots of things. <laughs> There's lots to say about that. I think we, I should start about the loop in terms of. Uh, um, I, I, we didn't feel like we exhausted, it, but I, I felt like uh, there was a moment, especially for example with the House of Pool. I've gotten so many requests to show House of Pool, and there's a constant request to show it as a, as a as a as a linear piece from a beginning to end, and I have resisted as hard as I can to not show it that way, uh, because I really believe in, in, the, in the format of the loop. And I understand in, 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 even with that in our work, there are some small uh, differences between the difference words how we have made it. And so there's different ideas about the loop, but uh, houses pool or um, single wide, they have a, we, we call this contentual uh, loop. Uh, so it, it's really inherent in the, in, in, in the, in the narrative. And I feel like that, um, to this point, I feel like it hasn't been really written enough about it or kind of the reflection about this has been kind of almost um, 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 kind of missed because uh, uh, we are so now used to the idea that things repeat just out of a convenience that we don't really think too much about the idea of loops. And even in our, uh, in our oeuvre, there are some of the works that I see more that just seem to repeat and others they have this like integral integral um, narrative part where it's really important that they that they're shown as a um, non non ending kind of entity and the museum in that way of course uh, uh, offers that possibility now going back to the more recent works which are more sites in somewhat somewhat more site specific or more documentary um, um, I, I, in having worked Having worked with sort of the idea of staging for so long, I, I, I sort of questioned the whole idea about uh, the documentary narrative gap. I, I see that it's very, very close. 
And uh, at the same time, I do think we, we, we utilize, I mean, but we, we can't really verbalize it ourselves. We don't we have, we haven't really found the right language how to describe what we do. And uh, there was just a moment, a very specific, so, so we understand these like Grand Paris, Texas, Medias, um, Giant, these are all works about specific sites where we look at how cinema has affected basically a site or has a touched a site. So Movie Mountain is a mountain in West Texas that is in the middle of the desert and it's called Movie Mountain. It's a very nondescript place and so we try to find out if Millet's, Gaston Millet's, the brother of Georges Millet's, actually might have taken a, a film there, has made a film there, which uh, that's basically the, the, the story of the movie. And it is possible because he traveled from San Antonio to Santa Barbara more or less during the same period. Um, it might also not be possible. We don't find it out in, 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 in the piece. Grand Paris, Texas is about the, the town, Paris, Texas, and it's about a, a cinema, the Grand, which is in Paris, Texas. And it somewhat uh, touches on, of course, Wim Wenders, but much more. And that's where, I mean, the, the story of Alan Hubbard which is, a, he's a character in this piece. So Alan Hubbard is not related to Teresa. Um, I think that story sort of explains the whole complexity about um, how, like the, how narratives and fictional narratives and documentary and how films influence us. So Alan Hubbard, when he was cast in a film, the film is called Tender Mercies, he was cast about a, about a six year old kid. Um, he never acted before. They took him out of the high school and he was a copy, you, we went to a casting agency and so they said, you know, um, you have to play a boy and you know, your father is dead, your father died in the Vietnam War. And Alan, Alan's actual father died just a year ago. So he had this incredible um, expression on his face and he believes that because he had that expression, he was cast for that movie. So eventually he go, this movie will take place. It was very hard to produce. He did win an, uh, an Oscar with Robert Duvall and Robert, in the story, Robert, in the film, Robert Duval is teaching this kid, Alan, uh, to play the guitar as a six-year-old. And, but Alan can't play the guitar, so it's all fake in the movie. And uh, but at his 10th birthday, uh, Robert Duval, as a very nice person, went back to Paris to see uh, Alan. He actually comes to his birthday and he gives him a guitar. And Alan, uh, on uh, Cheney, Alan, because Alan really appreciated that he never had a father, and to have this great actor coming to his uh, home and bringing a gu guitar, he decided to learn the guitar and he became a guitar teacher. That's all he did. He never went back into acting, and basically, but so he learned, he learned to play guitar after the whole story was, was shot. And so this character, Alan, that we met in Paris, Texas. This character led us basically to realize that there's some stories in Paris that we couldn't write, like it's, it's impossible. And so we really had to follow and one story led to the other. And that, that's why we kind of changed the format and we let things happen. And it is different in, in the way we work on these projects is very different because we are not scripting them. So we start at one end and eventually we stop at another end. But I mean, just to, just to add, um, we don't give up on the loop, so we work, we work on, on this piece, um, which is called 18. And some people might know, because they have seen it at, at the Pinacotheque, uh, it was 10 years ago, we showed a, a, the birthday party of an eight-year-old girl. And so we have tracked that girl down, and she became a dancer in her real life. She's a modern dancer now. And so we are shooting now, just as we, I mean, we start shooting next week, actually. Uh, we, we are shooting uh, with her in a fictional story where she plays a modern dancer. So there's sort of this moment where we decide to, to do something quite similar to what happens in Grand Paris, Texas, that was given to us to kind of use real life and mix it back with the narrative fiction. Yeah, and I think the connection between all, all this, this, um this border between fictional and, and documentary is something that you um, often mix, like you have this real site in house with pool where you actually shoot and um, you included um, things that really happened there, like the deers really came into the garden and um, so, so this, this, this border between fiction and, and documentary is something 
that you often work on. So I think that's a very consequent um, way of continuing your work. So, um, did you ever think of showing these works like Grand Paris, Texas, in a real cinema? Um, yes, uh, I mean, uh, I think Grand Paris, Texas is the longest piece that we have did. It's almost an hour long, and yes, we we have shown it actually. Um, twice, I think, in the cinema. Uh, it definitely lends to be seen uh, as a sit-down piece. It has a beginning and end, and uh, it's. Uh, I would show it. I would consider showing it, and I will continue showing it in, in the cinema. I think it is. I like showing it in a museum as well. I like. I, mean, I like some of the works to be in a museum just because they're seen somewhere, some way, somehow they're framed differently, and so they're seen in a different context. But um, that could also happen in the cinema. Okay. Um, I've got one last question because uh, before we open to the audience, and that would be a little bit about our festival. So Kino de Kunst focuses on new ways of narration in art and about um, on focuses also on how artists deal with cinema. And I would like to know. What do you think is the exciting aspect um, of this connection? Why has cinema as an idea become so important to the contemporary film and video art? Um, well, I think, I'm, I, think I mean, the most obvious to me seems that cinema is changing so dramatically. And so, just like photography, I see that sort of in, in parallel step right now, and I see there's so much, um, not in a negative sense, nostalgia, but sort of, you know, trying to reinterpret re-evaluate something that might slip out of the hand before we kind of can grasp it and so I think that's uh, definitely one of the big reasons why a cinema has a you know has to be put to the forefront and I think just in in, in terms of how we consume like I mean pictures cons consume our, our, we are consumed by pictures it seems like we are at the stage where it's almost like a parasite and when I see that, that, that just the flow and the amount and the, the double tasking that we do in the everyday life and the way we consume images, it seems there's uh, it seems um, of course artists are working with that. It's obvious it's at the forefront. Uh, I, I think that it's interesting that um, the sort of the indie ind independent filmmaking world is, is collapsing, and it's interesting that a lot of that is flowing into the museum because the museums after all have sort of a mandate of some, some sense of more conserving or co uh, cons conservatory kind of idea of like protecting and so maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a hope for a lot of independent filmmakers to find a slower pace or audience, a more attentive audience than they can reach in the non-independent world. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, I think that uh, that's a great question because uh, we didn't really talk too much about it. But uh, um, the one thing that allowed us, I think, coming out of photography is working with sound, and so it was a great kind of great new opening for us to contextualize what is happening outside the frame. And so we we're very very excited working with sound and sort of expanding, like having at the same time a closure and an opening, so you kind of can you can hide something and you can at the same time point to something and the sound is something that we work very very uh, extensively on to create sort of this this um, atmosphere of a, of a place that is uh, outside the frame earlier and I really um, you know I kind of share the um, your personal experience that you talk you know that you grew up in a Swiss village and it kind of like made me reference to cinema somehow 
but I'd like to ask you, you mentioned earlier about authorship and somehow you, you um, mentioned about bringing the auteur, you know, the, the, the term auteur into the audience. And I watched actually the film earlier, I've, I've seen it before in New York, but seeing a large screen like that was, I, I stayed like about an hour earlier mm -hmm. this afternoon. And every time after you know one look or the other, I, I found myself really give different interpretation, not in the narrative of the story, but really what I would like as an as an auteur, me writing the story, what will be the next step. So can you elaborate a little bit on this authorship, the auteur of being like you're the writer, the script, but all your the, the characters on this are silent. So you kind of shift the auteur, but we're you know or the students here, or you know, the, um, what the grand hotels are about in the cinema. So it seems like you take a shift now with your um, art and you giving the hands to the, to the viewer. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do. And I think that's also because we didn't talk too much about the idea of the loop. I think in Houses Pool, that really is probably the case. If you, if you can take the time and enjoy it, that you actually would decide to stay several times and actually go through maybe several uh, sort of um, iteration of it. I mean, it, I think Houses Pool and like maybe the shorter piece of Signal Wipe, they're, they're really set up. I mean, I really have to hope that you could you could enter and exit at your own and um, create your own, uh, uh, your own kind of interpretation. And of course, as you keep watching it, it changes. And so I have, I have quite a bit of, of people talking to me about it, how they differently interpret it, because they actually enter the, this piece initially at a different point. And so they read initially a different relationship between these three characters, and that changes as you keep, as you keep watching it. And I think it's just, I think there's two things. One is Teresa and I, we collaborate, and I think that allows us automatically to be somewhat uh, more open to that, like, because we, we also have a lot of, there's always a viewer in us, in some ways. I mean, there's always me or three sister viewer. So we, there's not this individual author. And so that maybe makes us somewhat more aware of a viewer, or maybe we just um, would like to allow that opening. But I'm very much inter interested in, 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 in the possibility to extend, um, to make it possible that there, there's, there, there's sort of a character, there's sort of a development that stays as you keep watching it. Interesting, a lot of people have asked me over the years if I would like to make a, a feature out of Houses Pool, and that's the other thing. Uh, I, I always, when somebody asks me about it, I'm always somewhat disappointed because I, I sense that they suggest that it's not finished or something, but it's finished for me. I don't want to. To, to finish the character, I want to, to leave that character where, where they are, and I don't want to tell the rest of the story. That's that's the point. That's the, the, the very special character of this work, because um, it's amazing that when I talk with people about this work, then they always stayed longer than one sequence, though so they always try to get the story, to find out what, what you're telling, and I think this is a very special and, and yeah, very good strategy to to make the people curious what you're telling, and then um, yeah, people just sit there and view the loop again and again and again. And I think that is um, a very special character of the work. Mm -hmm. um, I thought maybe we could talk just a little bit about the connection between the architecture and um, the psyche, because in in house with pool. Um, you show the house um, in the daylight and it seems very close, so like it would not like to, to offer its mystery, I call it now, even if you don't like that. And in, in the night, then it's really, um, all lights are on and it seems kind of transparent. And um, I think there's a connection between the, the story you tell and the way you, you show the house open and closed. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, um because we actually lived or we spent quite a bit of time, basically a summer there, we really experienced uh, the architecture and it's very uncomfortable, which I learned, I don't like modernist buildings anymore. Like I don't, I mean, I like to visit them, but I don't really like to live in them. And you're incredibly exposed at night. It's very uncomfortable, especially in like 
that this was shot in, in Austin. So you, you, you're aware of quite a bit of landscape around you and you have no sense of what's going on outside. And you're in this incredible glass bronze and you feel incredibly vulnerable. And so actually you're much more comfortable in daytime when you, when you feel like in control and you can look out and you have to sense you, people cannot watch you. And I, I think that house was such a gift to us to be able to, to, to work in this house because it had all these uh, it had all, all these these meanings. What's really interesting to me, I mean, just one short story is like actually there, there was a woman who saw this piece in um, in Fort Worth, and this woman lived in this house when she was a, until she was about twelve, and she basically contacted us, and she was like traumatized because she she, she claims that it, this this opened up everything in her family history. So she actually lived in this house. And she was. She had no idea that this exists. And walked in the art museum, sees her house, and sees her what she perceives as her childhood. So there was an incredible amount of um, um, expression or something going on. So, so I think you, it's the house. You know. Did you include other stories um, which actually happened in the house for the story, or is it more like a fictional story? Um, well, it's interesting. There's two stories. I mean, one is the, the most. One was. This house was still maintained. One is the house was shifting down off the hill, so the owners tried to figure out if they want to tear it down or rebuild it because it was slowly going down the hill. And the other story was because of that, there were these gardens who would come every once a week, and so we would see them walking around. The, they would upkeep the outside but not the inside. And then there was another story that actually it was it was about a dog, and it was a very horrible story. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> But that led us not to tell the story, that led us to the beer. So it's, it's sort of a story that didn't make it, but solved the problem with what happens in the, in the pool. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No. Can I ask one? Yes, sure. Talking about the, um, the shooting and the production, you mentioned the story of the dog. How did you manage, obviously, you? Because you say you live there, like you have the deers around the character. I mean, the deers, when they see you, um, they run away. So, I mean, you know, having crew and cameras, you know, so close. How did you, I mean, how many days were you experimenting with having the, the animals around you? Um, it must be quite a few nights, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the animals, there would be, there was two things. The animals would be there. Uh, mostly on, on a drive home. They would not be that close usually to the house. Uh, I did talk to the pool, uh, the pool guy, uh, several pool guys that wanted to know if deer drown, if that happens, and he assured me that that actually is not uncommon in uh, Texas at least. And so that was an important part of the story. And uh, um, it's just like uh, you, you know, it's the magic of film. Get the animals where they're supposed to be. And we <laughs> wait. <laughs> so, okay, there are no questions anymore. I thank you very much, Alexander, for thank being you. here tonight. And thank you all.